they're getting rid of the floating meeting controls. I have to someday figure out, oh, it's the, the pin is centered. I like that. All right, everyone, welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, it's going to be a very exciting one. Uh, parabiosis plus a great case. Plus a interesting observation on men's irrational confidence. So this is today's uh, CME code, Vertox. We have applicants out there in the interworld, and uh, we want to welcome you all. I'll be speaking to you in a, about an hour and a half. Looking forward to it, telling you why Duke is great. A uh, few announcements. Our department took it nationally and internationally. We uh, had a group that did uh, three lectures and 11 posters at the epilepsy meeting, and Rick Bedlack and the ALS team was talking in Switzerland about IGF binding protein seven and ALS. So good work, everybody. Don't you think that Duke logo there is a little dated and scary? I mean, does everyone know why they're the Blue Devils? So the Blue Devils was a French military unit in World War I. And they went into battle with like big flower, uh, you know, a feather in their cap and blue outfits. And then they were all mowed down because they were just like peacocks. And then, they, you know, they started dressing more appropriately. And, but I don't, that, that's why they're the Blue Devils, but that's like not a good name. Okay, tonight is the seventh night of Hanukkah. We're also into the Advent season to all our colleagues celebrating that. We say, uh, wonderful, enjoy. I'm not the biggest Christmas fan, I have to say myself, if anyone cares. Uh, Amy Opsy, nominated by Andy Liu for our All-Star Award. Uh, Andy said, Amy is an outstanding research coordinator, but more importantly, a better person. I couldn't have written that better myself. And I don't even know Amy. I nominated Andy Liu because I was sitting in clinic on Friday and Kim Askren comes in and says that one of his memory patients, as is their want, shows up on the wrong day and is creating a scene. And Andy, even though he had a full schedule, said, okay, I'll see her. And I and Michelle Marr, a, a medical student, were sitting next to him. We were so proud. And I also did that as a message to everyone in the department, too. <laughs> and not everyone's getting a coffee cup, but see them if they show up on the wrong day or 15 minutes late. Because they've been parking in Duke South, and that takes an hour. Okay, some more good news. Wayne. This is all about Wayne and his group. The Duke UNC Collaborative uh, Stroke Project just received a monstrous NIH grant and Wayne's uh, transcranial direct current stimulation uh, study received a, another almost million dollar supplement. So great job, Wayne. Vincent Chang talks about uh, what it is time as an internal medicine resident stand out. And as our applicants on the, on the, the line, you know, your three years of neurology makes you a neurologist, but your internship makes you a doctor. So you got to do a good internship. I've always said that. So this is said one day he was horrified by a patient outcome that I don't know whether it was his cause or not, just maybe he saw something really horrible happen. But he talks about how his team was so great and supportive to him. But I also know Vincent would be great and supportive to everyone else as well. So Thank you for that. Coming events, so Heather Whitson, Laurie Sanders are uh, showcasing the Duke Aging Center's uh, 2023 Research Symposium, which is tomorrow, but luckily doesn't overlap with the department's holiday Christmas event tomorrow at the JB Duke Hotel. Now we all know what JB stands for, right? There's the one man who knew it, the rest of you didn't, but now it's James Buchanan Duke, the son. The son, the man who made the money. Brian McGrory and Jim Burke. Uh, look at Jim in retirement. Look at that smile. That shows you what retirement is like. <laughs> so uh, they were part of a study that found stroke mortality and morbidity in stroke eligible patients were the major cause of increase in Medicare hospice related admissions. <laughs> and our neuromuscular group, Don Sanders, Janice, and Vern were part of a study 
looking at women with double seronegative myasthenia gravis seen in the clinic due to a database that they've been operating for over 20 years. All right, here it is. This is a, a guess. What percent of men think they could safely land a commercial jetliner if both pilots suddenly became stricken? I mean, I, I, I talked about this yesterday. Most. Don't answer if you were there yesterday. All right, what, what do people think? Okay, okay, so you're, you're on the right track. The answer is 50%. Uh, 50% of men think they could land like a 747 because they've been watching too many movies. <laughs> but the crazy thing is 19% of women also thought they could. And the correct answer is 0%. Like there are a lot of buttons up there. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with people. How could they possibly think that? These are the same people probably think they could do brain surgery, you know, because they've been watching too many of those ads on TV. But anyway, the answer is, None of you could do it, but 50% of men and 100% of neurosurgeons, right? <laughs> Think they could land a plane. All right, here's today's CME code. Ooh, and today's case is a Gabrielle Kreitzer. I didn't see this slide. <laughs> Otherwise, I, that's your middle name, right? Yeah, yeah. all right, take it away. This is you, let's do share. Can you believe that? I mean, we, of course we can believe, but it's insane that anyone would believe that. I bet nobody else on the plane would believe that 50% of the men could land the plane they were on, but they could. I think, Will, are we sharing again? Um, yes, it looks great. See, like sure. All right. Take it away. Awesome. All right, everyone. I'm Florina Gabriella, but I go by Gabriella. Um, and this is my ground rounds case presentation. Let's see, just tap on it. it okay. So we have a 51-year-old male, history of gout, arthritis, some alcohol use, that came in with acute onset confusion, dysarthria, and ataxia in the setting of being found down at home. Family hadn't heard from him for several days, so they called for a wellness check where he was found altered with the above symptoms, also incontinent. He had no recollection of the days prior, how he got on the floor, but seemed pretty unbothered to his current state, which family said was very unusual for him. Um, relevant history notable for the fact that he had called out of sick I called out of work earlier that week due to feeling sick, but didn't show up when he was due back on Thursday. And he did have a mild cold, maybe about 10 days prior to his last seen normal. When he came in, vitals were really unrevealing. Labs just had a mild leukocytosis, some AKI and a mild transaminitis, but nothing really revealing for cause, as well as pretty extensive imaging that I started mentioning here that again, really didn't have any ideology to his presentation. On his neuro exam, um, it was most notable for mental status changes of mild disorientation, confabulation, some dysarthria, some extraocular weakness, most notably in his bilateral lateral recti. And then the sensory changes described here with a very severe sensory ataxia in all his extremities and decreased reflexes throughout. He had a very extensive workup, which I won't go through all of these details now, but essentially imaging of his entire neuro access, two lumbar punctures with autoimmune panels, serum perineuroplastic panels, multiple infectious workup were negative. Thiamine was also normal, EEG unrevealing. The only real notable thing that popped up was a non-link dependent sensory motor axonal polyneuropathy that appeared to be subacute. And this was done about 10 days into his hospitalization. So I've just attached some of his images here to share, but largely kind of going through his uh, slides, there really wasn't anything revealing for cause of his altered mental status along with the other cranial nerve symptoms that he had. Um, did have maybe some like frontal parietal atrophy, but nothing that could truly explain his presentation. And no contrast enhancement either. And then lastly, we had done his cervical and thoracic cord as well, 
but again, no lesions to explain his ataxia. So putting him together, despite all of this extensive workup, we felt his presentation was most consistent with a Bickerstaff brainstem encephalitis. This is a rare autoimmune process affecting both the peripheral and central nervous system. It was first described by a British neurologist in the 1950s, and it's part of the anti-GQ1B antibody syndrome that shares some overlap with Guillain-Barre and Miller-Fisher, among a few others. It's largely a clinical diagnosis, although lab testing and imaging can be useful, and we'll get into this shortly. Typically follows a monophasic course following some sort of GI or upper respiratory infection, and sometimes usually resolved by three months, if not by six months. The classic triad presentation is ataxia, ophthalmoplegia, and encephalopathy, although you can have other cranial nerve deficits, hyper or hyporeflexia, and some limb weakness. And the altered mental status component does help differentiate it from some of the other anti GQ1B syndromes. And then below are listed some of the differentials that we had considered for our patient, but then ruled out by different means. Getting into the pathophysiology of Bickerstaff, it's presumed to be autoimmune in origin um, with a post-infectious molecular, molecular mimicry triggering an immune response where antibodies against the GQ1B receptor um, are formed, and then they attack these ganglioside that are largely expressed on peripheral nerves and the dorsal root ganglia at neuromuscular spindles, also in areas of the brainstem like the reticular activating formation that we see here that can explain some of the encephalopathy and sometimes even coma that can present with this process. Um, and then listed below here are also some of the areas of the nerves that can be affected and then cause the symptoms that we see. So diagnosing it can be a bit of a challenge. It's very rare. Um, the most supportive thing is if you get anti-GQ1B antibodies in the serum. However, these are really only present in two thirds of cases and a negative test does not rule it out. Our other diagnostics are even less specific. As you can see here, elevated proteins only in 25% of CSF cases, MRI even less so with like 11 to 25% having some abnormal imaging finding. Nerve conduction studies seem to do best in terms of other uh, diagnostics was about 64% of cases showcasing some sort of axonal polyneuropathy. And then EMG findings can sometimes be present. Management is usually to help aid recovery, but doesn't really affect final outcome. And that's because of how favorable the prognosis is even without treatment. We commonly do IVIG and PLEX, steroids and supportive care. And of note, there really haven't been any randomized trials conducted for treatment of this due to its rarity and favorable prognosis. And overall patients tend to do fairly well. Most make a complete recovery within three to six months, regardless if they got any treatment. However, there are typical presentations and although infrequent leak relapses can occur. And these are my resources. No time questions. for questions. <laughs> cool. Thank, Thank you. you. That's two snaps, remember that? In living color. Was that in living color? Yeah. Great job. Great job. Which one? Is this yours? Okay, um, so I think a bunch of us have been really excited about uh, Dr. White's uh, Grand Rounds, just because it's kind of the subject is, it's both old school and modern, and uh, also the subject of many sci-fi movies of where young people are kept in dungeons to uh, donate fluids to old people. Uh, Dr. White is an ass still assistant professor, even after your paper? He came to my attention because he had this big splashy paper in was it science or nature? Nature. Yeah, yeah nature, nature aging, they have that. <laughs> nature aging uh, on his uh, parabiosis work. Uh, parabiosis has been around forever where you kind of attach an old mouse to a young mouse and the old mouse gets younger. Uh, but it's become 
it's been a fringe bit of research for years and what, over like the last five years, it's really become a hot subject. The idea that there is something in the blood that you could turn into an injection like the Ozempic for uh, aging, you know, a shot of Ozempic, a shot of whatever this stuff is and you know, you'd live forever uh, or at least you wouldn't fall apart as quickly. So uh, Dr. White did his uh, PhD in applied physiology at the University of South Carolina, where they just botched my car's manufacturing, which is why my check engine light is on, thank you. <laughs> he is a, a senior fellow at the Center for Study of Aging and the Duke Molecular Physiology Institute. Isn't that where you're sometimes, that's where our own Simon Gregory is. He's a member down there as well. Uh, so it's a great place down near Motor Co, uh, you know, that area down there where Duke does labs also in the Chesterfield building. So like a lot of downtown is actually uh, research labs. And uh, James has, has generously a, a, a agreed to come and talk to us today about his research in parabiosis in general. And uh, today's lecture is titled Young Blood Can Turn Back Our Biologic Clock but it cannot affect the clock that they stole from us, right? <laughs> All right, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for that introduction and thank you all for your uh, attendance and, and uh, happy to uh, share kind of really uh, the recent work out of my lab uh, and, and taking this topic kind of um, what we hope is kind of to the next level. So uh, again, young blood can turn back our biological clock. And that's because we've um, recently showed, and I'll of course get into that, that when we do our epigenetic biological aging, we're able to kind of walk the, the father time back a little bit with this approach, which, uh, which I will show in a minute. Just On the mouse? There we go. So the, the concept of, of um, the young blood has been going on for, for several years now, and it's really come to the forefront now, and it's quite a buzz in the aging field and, and uh, kind of uh, going into other fields as well because of this whole proteomics boom that we can identify factors and try to treat different diseases. But um, when you look at you know, this physiological aging, um, the hypothesis slowly uh, came about with the parabiosis, which I'll get to in a minute. But really, when you, when you look at these people here, of course, this is uh, kind of a artist rendition, but um, the same cells are in all, all aging groups, right? Uh, and there's no internal clock, so to speak. This is debatable, of course, but the difference is really the, the environment that this, this individual to the right versus the, the younger individual to the left? And are there things that are circulating that are dictating the cellular phenotype? So uh, the, the physiology on the left, the younger person to the left and to the right is very different. And is it just because of circulating factors? The, the host, the, the older person is responding to just what's circulating around. And if we can flip that, can we either accelerate if we go kind of left to right or slow down the aging process if we can perturb the circulating factors with aging. And that's kind of the approach that we took. There's kind of two uh, camps, so to speak, in this aging factors. There's the, well, there's a lack of pro-youth factors in, in aging. And then there's a lot of really good research now that might not disagree with that, but they say there's pro-aging factors or these kind of um, poisons to, to uh, that come about with aging that, that drive more of the phenotype than the loss or a combination of, of course of both. Um, so the, that is kind of the, the crux of how to target these things because it's not, if it's a loss, of course, there's an add back. And if it's these pro-aging, then we have to get them down. So uh, this is what started kind of this, um, this boom, so to speak, in the aging world is the parabiosis model. We can surgically join two mice together. And this has not been um, new, so to speak. You can look at the time frame going down to 
the uh, 19th century down there. So this has been done before. Now the use of a aging model is, is more new. Um, and you can see it's been done for aging. It's been done for metabolic diseases, determining uh, mutant phenotypes or, or a proof of concept that things are being secreted. So of course, of, uh, you can put the mutant mouse and then you can see any kind of effects on the, the other um, donor mouse, which in this case. Yep, so the, the models change, uh, change by, by the group, of course, but uh, we do that. I do that with my own hands a lot of times when collaboration with uh, Capri Bot, also in the DMPI and uh, Department of Orthopedics. But we uh, attach the, the flank of the mouse and the uh, muscle fascia on the triceps and the quad of the mouse. It's, it's muscle to muscle on the, on the uh, hind limb and fore limbs, and it's the flank of the mouse. So it's more of a fascia. We don't do any microsurgery. We are not, the mouse does all that, which is, which is thank goodness, because that would be a, a lot harder. Um, so in really a couple weeks, and you can really see this through a GFP mouse reporter, you can see all the, the vessels um, kind of anastomose over and the, because they're, you know, they're all um, hybrid mice, so you don't have any rejection issues. And you can see all of the, the blood vessels and the capillary beds fuse, and you get this beautiful cross circulation. So depending on how much you do, uh, will of course, dictate how much blood is coming over. We think we have a very good model because we do do the, some, some um, groups just do the flank. Um, we do all the musculature as well. So we believe we get even a better blood flow. Uh, they're heavily sutured early on, but really after that, uh, the tissues fuse and, and it's pretty hardy and they, they will stay connected for you know, for several months. Yeah, so really in about um, two, two weeks, you start seeing shared circulation, these factors coming over. And yeah, it could either be GFP positive cells, you can put a dye in there, you can just see the equilibrium coming over. And you get uh, really 50-50 share, maybe 55-45, depending on um, what you're looking at, but you, you do get a really good blood share. And that's why you can see all these conditions that um, are tested with this. But of course, we're going to talk about the one on top, the young to old. Now, over the past probably 20 years or so, this literature base has formed um, in a lot of different tissues. So the bone fracture repair, actually, the, the two big papers were done uh, here from Ben Allman's group and uh, Gabri Bott in orthopedics to show you know, the heterochronic uh, bone fracture, but then other groups have shown muscle, um, neuro stem cell populations, vasculature. You can, this is probably, you can probably put four more tissues on even since I made this slide or, or this, the review slide. Um, so basically across the tissues, the exposure of the old tissues to young blood has been found beneficial. I can't really think of an instance where it hasn't shown an improvement. So the, the potency of this is quite striking. And just kind of some of the, the, uh, the initial data that came out of uh, Sanford lab about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more at this point, showed if you connect the mice together and then injure muscle in the old mouse. So kind of walking uh, through that uh, figure to the left, I think it's A. So. Um, these are, I don't want to leave the mic because I know our, our virtual friends won't be able to hear me. Do I, oh, that would be good. Yeah. So this is a uh, regenerating muscle fibers and you can see the red fiber are the new fibers coming in and a young attached to a young. That's basically the, what they call the isochronic. That's our control. So it's basically just the young mouse. You can see the, um, there it is nice round myofibers. That's a cross section. So you're looking at the muscle. And then when you look at the old here, you see very few fibers. So it's, it's kind of uh, the regenerative capacity is quite uh, decreased. And then if you connect them and then give it exposure to young cells and young uh, proteome, young blood, you can see much more formation of more, fi or more um, mild fibers. And that's quantified here. And even at the cellular level, this is um, 
it, same thing in the muscle, same group, different, uh, different PI, but same group. Um, you can see the uh, cellular pr proliferation. And these are, I believe, not immune cells. So it's not just simply, oh, well, the young immune cells are coming over and doing all the work. Uh, these are a mix of uh, muscle stem cells and some of the fibroblasts that are needed for the regenerative program. You can see there too, uh, let's see here. The young, you can see lighting up. This is green BRDU. So they're very proliferative as they renew this tissue. And then the aged, you can see less. And then, and then with the exposure to the young circulation, you can see a lot more. Uh, a lot more just like growth cells. It's, yep. So with the parabiosis, you get the benefits of both um, soluble factors and cells. So that you get the double bonus here. And um, immune, cells. immune cells, yep, everything comes over. So you get the whole environmental change that comes over. That's why parabiosis um, is really a stronger technique than some of the serum transfers. And I didn't put that uh, literature in there, but um, good segue. The serum transfer, so just taking young plasma out and injecting doesn't give you the, the regenerative capacity that the parabiosis does. Um, not much. Yeah. So there are certain tissues that seem to be more receptive to that type of transfer, but it seems to be a cell and factor combo that, um, that is driving a lot of this. And of course the flip side, right? So, yep. Yes, so that extends lifespan and is pro-regenerative, but that shows, that highlights the power of the immune cell contribution. So that almost seems to be more important than the uh, soluble factors at the moment. So the other side, I told you the hypothesis that it might not be the pro-youth factors, but it's these pro-aging uh, factors that are causing problems. What happens if you put the pro-aging factors in this young healthy mouse? So on the left, I picked a brain for the audience here. Um, they, they did a bunch of tissues, but you can see um, this is the uh, kind of the stem cell region. Okay, there we go. Um, so these are kind of um, uh, brain uh, neural stem cells. You can see are lighting up in the young healthy mouse. And then we go old, old, you can barely see anything. And then when you go young, or excuse me, old serum into a young mouse, you lose the signal, which if I can get this back, there it is, you lose the signal. So you can see the same thing happens in the liver. You can see the same data. So a lot of proliferative um, kind of uh, homeostatic pulse in the young, that's the YY. And then when the old serum goes into this young, young healthy mouse, you lose this proliferative um, ability. So there's definitely a, a something in the old serum as well that is driving kind of a, a accelerated aging uh, phenotype in the young mouse. So definitely evidence for both. The old serum that are actually really good, that are keeping the old serum alive and keeping the young healthy. Uh, there are, however, data like this where you put the old I, I serum, mean, in, yeah. The difference between a, a nine-year-old younger is every single thing is still going to the gym, and a yeah. nine-year-old is a mess. Sure. You would imply maybe the other nine-year-old is something magical. Or they just don't overexpress yeah. these yeah. pro. You know, that's Maybe the thing. Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I think um, the 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 proteome and the immune system and, and its inherent heterogeneity is, is going to explain, I mean, of course, all these are the same age mouse and the same, but I think if you did this in humans, you'd get a huge span because like you said, it's not just a, a, a um, standard aging process in humans. All right, so this has, the, the parabiosis literature has been Oh, you know, one, it's because of the sci-fi approach and, and connecting people, but the, really the results are always kind of buzzworthy. Uh, they're always uh, reversing some sort of aging. Of course, when, when big science leaks into the media, you get 
you get the economists run some cartoons like this. You can see the uh, older individual trying to steal the blood and then he gets the blood, he feels great, he's, he's skipping rope. And then of course, if anybody's seen Silicon Valley, um, this uh, billionaire hires the young kid, of course, for transfusions because he wants to be young forever. So this is kind of where many years ago, uh, our group kind of took all of the um, previous data in consideration. Of course, the, the, the um, results are robust, but there were still questions out there. One is everything that we've seen are with the mice connected. So the question of, well, it's the immune cells. Well, it's, it's the other cells coming over. Um, what was all done in a four to five week span. So it was, it was generally quick. It was just, what are the, the effects of a, a short-term ex uh, exposure to this young environment, injure or just assess your favorite tissue and then harvest. We wanted to take more of a long-term approach. What happens if you put them together now instead of four or five weeks, 12, 13 weeks? Can we start to slow this aging process? We can see the benefits. The literature is clear. The, the data are powerful. What happens if we prolong this? Do, do you start to see biological aging start to slow or even reverse itself when, if given the, the time? Then the second thing we did was novel is we separated the mice back out. Because everything, again, you can't assess health span with a mouse that's attached. You can't make one exercise and one do a grip strength without the other one. Uh, we've actually tried. Uh, it's very difficult and you don't get really good data. So we learned how to detach the mice after the parabiosis. And now we can focus on the, the detached mice, whether whatever group they came from and, and follow them out, maybe longevity, maybe health span, physical function, some biology there. Um, so, uh, so that was the model. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that, yep. So in the, the mouse lifespan, um, they live uh, 30 months or so, and you can see kind of the, the aging field has, has brought into these categories of aging. And really the, the trajectory of, of frailty and the onset of a lot of the aging happens around 20 months to 24 months. That's what we consider old. And that's probably 90% of the aging literature. So we designed this to, to ask the question, what happens if right on the fall, that's when you get this prolonged exposure to young circulation. So hopefully we confuse the, the aging process saying, wait, I thought I was supposed to get old now, but I'm seeing all this young blood. Do we pause? Do we reverse? What happens? So maybe, you know, we want to just kind of flatten the line a little bit. So the model is we detach now for three months. Again, this is 12 weeks of parabiosis, which is the longest in the field right now. And as opposed to the four to five weeks of all that previous literature, and then we either keep them attached, look at some of the aspects of biological aging, um, or we detach them and we let them live out a lifespan where we can uh, measure function and lasting biology. So our first um, longevity study, we put them together in three months, we separate them, we let them live out like, like normal uh, in the vivarium. And we did see an induction of about nine to 10% longevity. So this is just old, old, attach themselves. That's kind of the control. And then the old attach to the young. When separated, the old, old, you can see are out in kind of the lighter pink to the right there. Or I'm sorry, the, the darker pink. And then you get this subtle extension of lifespan. They were, yeah, they were detached at 23 months. So, yes, so they were detached uh, they were attached over that 20 months to 23 months. So keep hitting this thing. Um, right at that kind of fall. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, 
and then they were attached to 23 months and then detached and let and let lift out. So we see an extension. Now, is this a, you know, a finding? Yes, it's the first study that showed the extension of lifespan. How does that compare to other longevity? It, it's very, it's minimal. Actually, you can do caloric restriction and all these growth hormone knockouts and extend out 27, 30%. So this is pretty much, it's a, it's a minimal extension of lifespan, but it's a significant one, to say the least. Um, and then when you look at the, the phenotype of these mice, so on the, uh, let's see here. this is before they were attached. This is during attachment and their measurements after their three months. So you can see lean mass um, falls as they, as they grow older. And then the heterochronic preserves lean mass. Of course, in the clinical world, this is very important. We want to preserve as much lean mass as we can. And then fat mass was also very interesting. So fat mass in the old ISO, they start as they get older in, in the, the mouse, um, they accumulate adiposity. This increases while they were together. Again, this is the control. And then they basically maintain until they get very old and then they become very frail and they actually lose fat mass. But while they were attached to the young, look at the fat. It was like a, a nice diet there. They came out of the attachment lean. So that exposure to young circulation lost adiposity. So it gained lean mass and it lost adiposity, which really for the most part, they kept off. It's not like the second they, they uh, detached and they were, they defaulted back to their old um, high fat content. They, they kind of kept it off, which was, which was kind of a telltale on what the, the biology that we saw. Yes. Yep. So we tracked them, tracked them way out. Now, how about function? So they, they look better. They're leaner. They have a little bit more mass. They're living longer. Uh, they're actually functioning um, much better as well. So grip strength, this is, they're not familiar. Basically, you just pull a, uh, the mouse on the bar, give them a tug and see how much they kind of fight that bar. It's uh, the best kind of um, in vivo strength to, act to if you want to keep the mouse alive um, that we have. So this is the young, young on top. You can see they're nice and strong. This is the old, old down here. You can see as they get detached and age, they lose quite a bit of strength. And then we get a little bit of attenuation there in the heterochronic. Now, even out here, you can, they're, they're still, you know, succumbing to aging and the decline, but these mice have not seen young circulation now for several months, but they're still seeing beneficial effects. So this was one of the, the really interesting um, findings. Same thing with the exercise capacity. Right out, right out of a detachment, of course, we give them one month to recover because it's a surgical intervention. And then they start running much better. But then the old ones, I mean, they, they barely, they just kind of flop around the treadmill and then you pick them up. They don't do anything. And then the heterochronic um, perform better all, out to three months. These are three months after they've been detached and they're still running much better than their, um, their old, old counterparts. So, so the, the phenotype is the extension of lifespan, the, the um, morphology improvements, uh, lean mass, adipose, and then functional improvements lasting far beyond their detachment. Initially, we thought they were going to perform well and then crash and then just default to their, to their age. We didn't see that. It was, it was, it was more of a flattening effect. So the, the question was, is there some sort of epigenetic in, in a kind of blueprint that's um, delaying this or resetting itself and, and causing the long-term benefits that we're seeing? Yeah. Um, as a control? No, as a, you know, what's going on? Just comparing old mice and young mice. 
see what's different versus comparing change to um, well, of, of course, you're not getting the any contributions of the, the young blood. Right. Sure. Right. Uh, yeah. So there's there is uh, the definite question that is unanswered of of you know why we're even seeing the decline. What is, what is the basic biology of aging? Is still a wide open question. No matter what you do, it's thousands of changes. Yes, right. So I'm just wondering why the parabiosis has access in picking those genes versus just comparing what's going on in the young mouse versus what's going on. Yeah, because it's almost a a cheat, right? Because we can we can mine young and old and attempt to figure out what the problems are and try to fix them. Parabiosis fixes them. And now we have to figure out why. So we've already we've already gone to the finish line. Now we're backing up. Possibly, but at least we know if you just did a screen on young and old and you get five thousand things, we don't know what the drivers are. You can start just picking off aging factors, but we know there's we know there's anti aging effects in this model. So something's the drivers are in there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's the same kind of model as as um, you um you can put exercise into there. You can put you know any kind of anti aging therapies. The ones that work go with it because as of now we don't know what's driving the aging process. There's a million possibilities, but things that work, then you can focus on. Okay, regardless of the other five thousand things, we know this. This is work. What's what's um, what's altering? So because of the persistence and function, we went kind of to the epigenetic clock, which is a little bit more uh, of a uh, long term adjustment. Um, not only can it be a predictor of aging, because as we age, um, most of the time, we increase methylation, and then that is one of the hallmarks of, of aging that, that suppresses gene expression or, or um, kind of drives the phenotype of aging. And you can make an algorithm of what the methylation patterns are as we age, as the mouse age. I think they now have multiple species of this. And you can predict aging. So that's, or you can predict what they call biological aging, but it's epigenetic aging. And then you can, that, that is a number that you can figure out, well, the mouse at 24 months is supposed to be here. How did our intervention affect that? Did we move it up, we move it back? And you can see where you are on this, this predicted line there. And this is where we teamed up with Betty and Gladyshev's group uh, at Harvard. They're one of the premier groups at, um, at this type of clock analysis, and they, they've done um, all the clock uh, expression data. So uh, we measured clock analysis in blood and liver for this, this particular paper. And um, this is the paper that was, was discussed um, earlier that had kind of quite a big splash because it was the, it had longevity, parabiosis, it had epigenetic clocks, it had all the buzzwords that the, that the media likes. So it, it hit New York Times, it hit um, all these kind of fancy uh, news outlets, which was uh, fun for the lab. Um, but we saw, uh, again, these, these predicted algorithms, you can see that this is the young, young, young ISO, uh, ISO as they were connected still. So again, that's the control. The old, old control, we picked up the aging effect, which we've seen before in the mouse. And then the young, young, I mean, uh, the heterochronic, so the old mouse connected to the young mouse, you can see its biological age either slows down or is reversed here. So we picked up the re reversal of the biological age. And then when they're separated out, the young mouse, um, now this, again, this is, I believe, two months after the separation, young mouse kind of looks equivalent. 
the old mouse, uh, if anything gets a little older because it is two months older, so we did pick up the sensitivity. And then um, kind of agreeing with the functional data that the persistence of this data, the epigenetic clock didn't default uh, or didn't default back to old, it kind of stayed down. So we've, we, we believe we've reset the, we've either reset or, or slowed the biological aging. Now, at, this is of course just one indices of, of aging, one hallmark, but if you stop the, the methylation and which then leads to of course suppression of genes, then that could stop a lot of the phenotypes that we see with aging and, and explain some of the tissue persistence. Now liver, we see the same thing. We can see uh, the induction of age and then the, the slowing of aging with the parabiosis, that's while they're attached. And once again, while they're detached, out two months, haven't, hasn't seen young blood in two months, there's the old guys. And then again, a reduction in biological aging. It was a little less than the blood, but we still see it two months out from seeing young blood. And of course, the methylome is going to affect the gene transcription and very striking without even knowing what the data are here. This is the old. And then in the clustering with the young, you can see the, the heterochronic parabiosis. This is liver matches much closer to the young. So, so preventing all that epigenetic changes, of course, we, we didn't, um, do anything to, to show an ex, you know, this is the assumption that epigenetic and gene expression are coupled, strong assumption, but we didn't test that specifically, but slowing the epigenetic aging slows the gene expression profile, at least kind of this correlation quite strikingly and moves that gene expression to a more youthful. And some of the, just the general hits that are popular in the literature, just showing uh, things like uh, suppression of um, the C1Q, which is uh, uh, inflammatory. CERT3, of course, is pro-survival. And then this glutathione pathway is more of a survival um, resilience pathway. So you can see, not only are we seeing this epigenetic pattern, this global mRNA, but when you look at genes for just survival and, and resilience, you can see the, the old head, if you just kind of saw... You can see the reduction in this pro-inflammatory, the induction of these survival pathways uh, that again are several, um, several months after either during, so this is while they're attached, while they're attached, and then after several months that these genes are still active. So that was kind of our paper that we just had out. And um, this kind of goes to the question here. So we're showing anti-aging effects, but we also show the literature kind of just is hinting on these pro-aging effects that we see. So what happens to the young mouse here? So when we, when we give the old mouse to the young mouse, we, everyone studies the old mouse, but the hypothesis that the group that says, no, I think it's the induction of these aging factors. So let's look at the young mouse and what happens there. And there is a case that there is pro-aging factors because the, the young mice, look how they accelerate aging. They accelerate the aging in, in multiple tissues, uh, liver, heart, brain, they accelerate aging. Now, the cool part about when they're detached is their youth prevails. What do I mean by that? Is they're able to reset their biological clock and recover from seeing the old exposure or, or seeing the old blood. So upon recovery, you can see their biological age comes back down. But there's something in the old blood that accelerates aging in the young mouse. They detach, but the young mouse can reset and get back to its chronological age by itself without any interventions. And once that old, uh, old blood clears, it can get back to its youthful state. Whereas the old, uh, I guess in a, in a good way, didn't, didn't bounce back to its chronological age and it kind of lingered a little bit.
but the young mouse did default back to its chronological age. Good for the young mouse and also good for the old mouse. Yes, did it answer you? Yeah, so you wonder if it's almost um, the, the, the young mouse, the, the, the resilience of the young tissues can rebound to the stressor, where in a kind of a, 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 a good way, I guess, in the old, they're a little slower to rebound because the old default, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't believe the old cells are trying to be old. They just have a lack of something. So if you give it the, this youth factor and take away, they're just behaving like it should, it's getting back to its performance. And then when you pull it, it just maybe slowly drifts and, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I think um, that's something we're working on, but that's kind of the thought process we have. Yeah. So I think. Yep. So you could you could go a very basic science question of what is every factor and how do we figure out what all of this, what is the cocktail? What is the drivers in the cocktail? You can't, but you can spend, and you can spend years and years trying to figure out what are the hot spots, or you can go in this translational zone of, Hey, it works. Let's maybe not care about how, but how about we just give, the components of the young blood <coughs> to an old person. And then we'll figure out the hows and whys later. But right now, the soluble fraction of the plasma. Yeah. Yes. So yes. So like right. So in that, that's actually uh, an experiment being done now. Um, in that case, there's a million hows and whys, what are the cytokine complexes? What are this and that? Or you just- say, How can I make a, a reasonable cocktail? Yes, and, and of course the, the hows and whys will come, but right now I think it's just, what are the components of this thing that are driving these anti-aging? Uh, I'm just gonna skip through this and get back to our, to save some just time. This audience, do you think this parabiosis stuff crosses the blood brain barrier? Uh, sure. I mean, this, these are all the, the, everything that's coming from the serum we'll, we'll get through or, or, or the things that do cross in the young or, or in the old will come through from, from, there is data that this stuff yes. So it's getting through. So, uh, it's getting through immune cells are getting through. So I, I do. I mean, that might be a way of limiting what you're looking at. I mean, it's what gets through the brain is yeah yep um so just a quick summary we extend lifespan um function and we've delayed kind of the epigenetic biology now what we wanted to do real quick and this is the unpublished that we're going uh going into now is a little bit more all right what's broken and how do we how do we fix it now the problem with that <laughs> yes, but the, the proof, the, the point is you get this old car, you, you know, throw a little paint on it, new tires and new engine and off it goes again. So that's the same thing with the, with the, the kind of the mouse here. What are the, the, the rejuvenating hotspots that we can drive this, this, um, these effects. Now, when we think about immune and the proteome, and general inflammatory tone, to me, of course, we can probably argue this, uh, the liver is the driver. So it, when, when you talk, talk about what are, what are the proteomic components, well, we can figure out why, or we can just let the liver do what it does and secrete these, these, um, these uh, metabolic young metabolites or young proteins, and that might help the old proteome and, and do what the parabiosis does just in a small scale. Of course, for this audience, 
um, that could explain some of the um, protective effects. Because if you change the metabolism, remember this, this mouse has more lean mass um, and less adiposity and functioning better. We haven't done a lot of the metabolic phenotyping, but I'm assuming it's probably more insulin sensitive and its lipid panels are better. And that could explain some of the, the cognitive data that you, there are the enhancements and a lot of the, um, the benefits to, um, to peripheral, including the, the brain. So the approach we took of, instead of combining the, the mice and, and let the young mouse liver give circulating factors to the old, how about we just put, make a, um, a young liver in the old mouse and see if that circulates the, the factors. And this is very preliminary and we're just kind of throwing a teaser out here. So the model is um, to do this uh, extreme 75, 80% hepatectomy, uh, inject young liver cells as the, the liver regrows, it basically grows back with these young cells. This is in collaboration with Anime Deal um, here at, in, uh, at Duke and um, Sehun. Uh, her, her really skillful technician, uh, faculty technician, um, who, who has helped uh, done a lot of these, um, do a lot of these experiments. And then really what we're seeing is uh, the initial data bites here are improved liver function. So this is um, some of the clinical markers, AST goes up with aging. And again, our ends are a little down. So we have some trends here and there, but we can see a uh, return of this or suppression of this AST. Um, we can see albumin. We have a, a trend for a drop in albumin, which you see a lot in um, aging. We can see a rescue in the heterochronic liver. So basically liver function is improving. And then we're getting a similar effect on phenotype. So this is uh, aging effect of adiposity. We get that rescued when the liver is now young. Uh, we get uh, improved, it's trending, but improved lean mass. And uh, this is just kind of our eventual um, uh, to-dos. And then we're going to label these hepatocytes with a marker that we can basically measure the proteome that are coming from the young hepatocytes. That might give us a cleaner look on what the drivers are into the proteome. And... Um, explain some of the benefits of parabiosis. For time, I'm gonna scoot through this. And then I'm gonna leave kind of this last slide of, uh, this is now being done in humans. There are a lot of clinical trials with serum transfers and um, slowly immune transfers. So these could be something that could be uh, a disease specific intervention or just a pro longevity. And, and I think some really cool things are happening in the aging field that could be the next, you know, generation of the 150 year old with health span, which is key, not just lifespan. And then I'll skip through and go to my, again, uh, thanks to my lab here, um, Gurpreet Bot again in orthopedics was a um, great collaborator, anime deals group, and then the Gladys Shev at Harvard. I'll end there and thank you for your attention. Yeah, and we have plenty of, uh, look. <laughs> so uh, we've got the room, so plenty of time for questions. And let me get the chat going. Questions from the room, Wayne? Wayne? Yes. Uh, no, no, uh, I can imagine that would be tough. To, we have enough trouble getting through um, IACUF with NICE. I can imagine if we were going to sew monkeys together, they would, um, that would be a lot more paperwork. So. Uh, the rat and the mouse are the only anything, are the only known species that have done at least for aging the model. Yeah, that would be a lot of suture. Yes, I guess my question. And I would just say, uh, once uh, anyone on the internet, just put your name or your question. Okay, we'll get they're coming in. Right, I'll try to. Yeah, so, yep, so serum transfer um, has shown beneficial effects on cognition and aging. And I think uh, there was another group that showed beneficial effects on some other tissue, but um, the regenerative 
a lot of that data that with the regenerative program, bone, muscle, you lose that. So there's definitely um, some, huh. some. Uh, Get the award for yeah. <laughs> There's definitely different drivers with the serum transfer, the soluble factors, metabolites versus the cells. And I can tell you that you get the most kind of effects with both, but the serum transfer of course is easy, right? You just, you, you um, isolate it and you inject it. And people have been doing that in the clinic now, uh, clinical trials for some time. And I think that data is slowly coming out, but we'll find out how potent it is soon. Why don't you take a shot at some of the interweb questions? <laughs> okay. They're uh, also on your screen here as well. All right. Is there any evidence of aging reversal in the human transplant literature, young heart? Ah, so um, we are... We are currently, as you can see by the, the last little uh, data slides that we, we're, we're taking that approach of um, heterochronic tissue transplantation. Now in the clinic, uh, I'm sure the data is there. I don't know if anyone really has gone after that as far as uh, can we show um, any correlation between either engraftment or longevity on the... Um, tissue age versus the um, recipient age. The drugs. Yeah, that's a big confounder, right? Because they're under these huge um, uh, How about this one? drug load. Is pregnancy kind of the same thing? So um, pregnancy accelerates biological aging and then after birth and some recovery time uh, recovers. Um, so in the world of MS, we have a bunch of MS doctors. That's like a big thing in their world that pregnancy is a time, am I right, where the disease gets all quiet and then it comes roaring back afterwards? Yeah. So uh, we did do, um, we did uh, some um, stressors, we called, and we just, in the, the human um, data, we did um, surgery, we did COVID, we did pregnancy. Uh, and then those were all uh, stressors that induced biological aging, but upon recovery brought down. So the other factors of pregnancy. Because as you age, the disease kind of changes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we don't know the, the, the biology of pregnancy to, see, to figure out what is it, but that's a great question. Any, any questions here? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think there was one or two papers out there. Can you repeat the question? Uh, so telomere length, of course, the, we want um, longer telomeres are, are um, more anti-aging. That's the theory. And then as we age, the telomeres get shorter. And then eventually that leads to cellular um, uh, dysfunction. Um, so the parabiosis, I think, has linked to... Uh, I think has shown to preserve telomere length. I think it was an older paper. I don't think that has been kind of replicated since, but I do remember one showing what that hallmark of aging is also improved. Yeah. Was that your question? Only because I think a lot of the, um, the genetic repairs of that didn't, spawn what they thought it would but that's still that's still in the aging field i just was at a, a nice talk with telomere length so it's still there um but something i saw another hand or am i seeing things okay i'll give that a one percent chance of being reproduced <laughs> <laughs> um uh, one once you handle the one more question. Yep. For me. Um, Thanks. Epigenetic. So, Andrew, are there epigenetic changes seen generally distributed across the genome at particular regions? Um, so, uh, Andrew, um, we haven't looked at the particular hotspots, so to speak. Uh, we've used these epigenetic clocks as kind of these global indices and predictors. We are now digging into some of the, um, the regions that are changing. So hopefully I'll uh, have an answer for that soon. But currently, no, we don't know exactly um, the, the, the areas that are more um, sensitive to the, uh, to the procedure or 
correlative to the anti-aging um, at, at, at this point anyway. And uh, for Kevin's question, I think you answered that, didn't you, in your talk? Any... That the reverse age to young? Yes, so the young mice definitely um, accelerate aging, but again, they are able to come back. There is a study that shows their lifespan though is shorter after the surgery. So even when they're detached and let, you know, live out their lives, they do have a shorter lifespan. So maybe they don't def default back to their uh, chronological age as well, because they do show um, shorter lifespan. That was just a great talk. You're, you're a great speaker as well as, as the science. So, uh, Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, what we Three questions from the audience? Like we usually get none, absolutely none. <laughs> and even the residents were curious. So All right. That's, well, a big, that's a big win. Anyway, so thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. It really was a great talk. Appreciate that. Well, it's it's a so, fun topic. Yeah. Um,